Well, thank you all so much for coming today. We thought that we would sort of end the day with just a quick wrap up and summary of w some of the things that have been discussed today. Um, let me start by just thanking all of you for coming and joining us today. It's been a fascinating and great con series of conversations. Um, we have a number of university presidents here, chancellors, provosts. Many of you come from universities yourselves or you interact with universities as entrepreneurs. And to have you in a room and be able to take take part in this important conversation has been incredibly uh, valuable and rewarding, not only for, I think, for us and for hopefully you, but for the Times as an institution. Absolutely. Um, so I wanted to pull a couple of threads that I thought um, were very visible, at least to me, through the day. And one of them is these tensions and um, challenges of opportunity and access. You know, so many of these panels and the conversations I know that you have amongst yourselves about how to enlarge the set of opportunities schools offer. And that has always been such an important um, aspect of higher education in the United States. But the more we know about how important university educations are, another theme we've touched on today, the more it's clear how crucial it is that we have opportunity and more access for more students. That sometimes takes universities, especially selective schools, out of their comfort zone, creates different kinds of student bodies, and creates difficulties. Um, and that I also, I think it's important um, to be kind of candid about that and think of that as a challenge. And, and it also leads me to a feeling I always have when I think about higher ed, which is just how much you are being asked to do. Um, how much universities are now dealing with mental health issues, thinking about providing online kinds of courses, really being pulled into so many dimensions of people's lives in a way that, to me, feels different from when I was in college. Um, I'm not going to say how many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of what Mayor Emanuel talked about this morning. And he was actually talking about K through 12. He was talking about closing schools, which is something that he's done, and, and as Charles noted in the question, done in a way that has raised uh, a, a fair amount of criticism. Um, uh, and he said, look, it's never popular to close schools. And it actually struck me as we think about all the things that colleges are being asked to do, right? Mental health, be entrepreneurial, reinvent yourself for wave five, um, uh, be more diverse. Uh, if you're already diverse, be better at completion. I mean, there's an enormous amount. It struck me that one of the most important questions for colleges to ask themselves, given all the demands that society's putting on them without a lot more resources, um, is what can colleges stop doing? <laughs> what can be shut down? What don't you have to do? And that's really, really difficult politically in any co sort of organization. Um, but it strikes, particularly a shared governance organization, but it strikes me that it's also really important. And I made a reference earlier to the New York Times, but it's something that we think about a lot too. We here are being asked to do enormously new things that we never did before, right? We're supposed to be a wire service and a magazine at the same time. And I think one of the things we're asking ourselves is, okay, as we do all these new things, conferences, what are some things that we used to do that we shouldn't anymore? And it's incredibly difficult politically, but it strikes me that it's one of the few places that universities can actually find the resources to do the new things or to stop doing some of the older things. And one of the things that struck me about your conversation, David, with, with Rom this morning, it, Rom and I are on first name basis. E everyone in Rom is on first name basis. Because he yeah. told me that if my dead grandparents wanted to vote for him in Chicago, mm -hmm. they'd be welcome to do so. Um, <laughs> is that <laughs> anyone from Chicago here? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that Mayor Emanuel and many of the panelists we heard, whether we were talking about Title IX, whether we were talking about sexual assault, there was a, a sense of uh, an apology in the conversation, that these are important issues, that people are making very hard decisions, and they're making them unapologetically. I think if we had this conference, and we've had this conference for a number of years, if we had this conference 10 or 15 years ago, we would probably hear a much more academic conversation around some of these topics. But they're very present, very vital right now. And I think all of you, and I know from talking in the lobby with a number of you, that these are not conversations about topics that are ephemeral or theoretical, but that they're what you're living with every single day. And on behalf of the Emily and David, as well as everyone who's put this, this conference together, and hopefully on behalf of you, let me just say that the New York Times is devoted to being a part of this conversation, to fostering this conversation. We're so proud to be able to welcome you and to thank you for participating, because particularly in education, the leadership of ideas is really what drives forward what is going to be happening two years, five years, 10 years from now. It's such a dynamic time. It seemed like there was so much 
potential pessimism and optimism on this stage. And so I hope that you'll continue having a conversation with us and with each other. We would welcome hearing any of your thoughts and comments about today or about education going forward. And thank you so much for joining us. We enormously appreciate it. Have a great year. Thank you. Thank you.